Okay, well this time around we're going to be looking at a very different kind of game. Now, it comes from a company I haven't dealt with before. It's called Command Post Games. That's the company. Copyright 2018. And it's uh, Gettysburg, of course. And it's part of their, what they're calling their Pub Battle series of games. They also have a Waterloo game. I think there's a battle on Little Bighorn and some Napoleonic battles. Now, the game comes in this long tube came well packaged, indestructible really, very well packaged and all the pieces come in this single tube. So when you get your game uh, the rules are going to be rather curled. They're punched so you can put them in a binder which I'll be doing and flattening. I'll be putting this under a weight to flatten them out there. I haven't really looked at the, the rules closely yet. I'm just doing this introductory video to show you how the game comes. You get these cards here, and like many toys these days, some assembly is required. You have to uh, make some cuts here, and on the back they talk about folding some things. So I'm not really sure what these are for. I'll have to look them up in the rules. Now, the pieces, like many of the block games these days, you get a whole bag of Confederate pieces, long rectangular pieces, uh, dice of course. You get these little wee circular, I think they're headquarters pieces. You get the Union in a very, very uh, dark blue. So where the assembly comes in is you're going to have to put these uh, decals for each of the uh, Union divisions and the Confederate divisions. So I'll have to be very, carefully, um, be very careful about assembling those. These, I think, are the, yeah, they must be the core designations. Again, a decal. And uh, these are the leader designations. So these are peel kind of um, decals, which you'll put on. And then, then there's these Union flags and Confederate flags. Probably for control markers, I'm not sure. Then there's this little wee, this will be a movement stick. Now, this is only just a piece of paper, really. So I'll probably be mounting this on good quality cardboard. And then there's some little instructions about putting the game away. So that's how the game comes. So um, I'll decal these up. Maybe watch a movie or something at the same time while I do that. And then we'll get to the game itself. Okay, this is the game after I've decaled up the uh, counters there. They look pretty good. And uh, I'll be zooming in on the pieces to give you a better idea. Remember, the game does come in this long, long tube there. So the map that I'm showing you here comes folded, uh, I mean uh, rolled, not folded. So you don't have those unsightly fold markers and stuff. This is a paper map. And I put it under glass, under plastic, as I always do, to keep it flat. Uh, the company does offer a beautiful deluxe map, which I happen to see at uh, WBC. They're kind of, uh, I'm not sure what they're made of. They're, they're, anyway, thick. They're almost a cloth material. They're absolutely gorgeous. But th those are a premium to, to purchase those. Uh, you get three red dice for the Confederates, three blue dice. You get this uh, black die, which I wasn't sure what it was for at first. I later find out that it's used as a time record marker. But um, I decided to make my own little wee numbers. You'll need eight of them for the Battle of Gettysburg. So the six-sided dice, I didn't think it was very good. Uh, number markers are just as efficient. So I'll be using uh, these when I play the game. Um, these, these are the uh, chits after they're all mounted up too. Like I said, we'll zoom in very close uh, so you can see what, the, uh, what they look like. I did figure out what these cards are for. You, you cut them out then you fold them and they're used for the uh, reserve uh, option which I won't be uh, playing with right now where you can hide your troops from the enemy and uh, bring them out on the board at the appropriate time uh, more on that later and you get a mess of uh, blank um, counters which at first I wasn't sure why you got so many but they're in conjunction with the baggage train uh, counters and uh, we'll get to that in a moment. 
Okay, here's a closer look at the pieces after they've been stickered up. I've got over on the left there, that's uh, the third core under AP Hill. And uh, for those of you who know the order of battle to Gettysburg, you'll notice that the counters for the Confederates are not divisions or brigades, they're sort of demi-brigades. So Heath's division is divided into a left and a right, representing about two to three brigades. Same with Anderson. That's the 3rd Corps Artillery, and there's some really cool trains for these baggage uh, trains. There's some cool rules, I should say. They are really neat. I'll get to that later when I show you some movement. Now over on the right is an example of a Union Corps, Reynolds' 1st Corps, uh, Wadsworth, Robinson, and Rowley. The special little star on Wadsworth's division means that it has an elite unit. It's because the Iron Brigade was with that uh, division. And, of course, there's the uh, baggage train, too. Now, you may notice, for those of you, again, who are familiar with the order of battle, hey, where's the first Corps artillery? Well, the Union does not have uh, Corps artillery. Instead, they've got the artillery reserve, which means that they've obviously factored in the artillery into the strength of the infantry. Again, an abstraction. This isn't a precise, precise order of battle, but it does the job. Over here are these, the chits, which are going to be put into, you know, an opaque container. You'll drop them in the container, shuffle them up, and draw them, and that's how it'll be determined which units move uh, during the turn, who moves first, who moves second, and so on. Now there's a close-up of the movement stick in black there for foot units and what you do is you put your unit at the beginning of the stick there and it's allowed to move to the end of the black stick so movement is quite easy you just literally move it up that stick and that would be a typical move for Heath's division and if the unit was in column this is what's kinda neat let's say the unit was on uh, the tiny town road here not a good example because the Confederates wouldn't be on the Tony Town Road. But when a unit is in column, you take one of these blank units and put it behind. And that's to show when it moves at double the speed on the road. It's actually spread out, you know, over a mile or so. So as you move the units up that road, you'd move the blank unit behind it again showing you how much uh, road space that unit takes. I noticed that in some of the reviews of the game um, people talked about this chain that came with the, the game. My game did not uh, come with this chain but I just happened to have a, uh, a chain that looked just like it and coincidentally enough it's almost the exact same size uh, of the movement stick. Um, I think they were saying that the chains were causing a bit of a problem. They were problematic. I don't know. I think I could see um, a case where they can be used. Here at Gettysburg, where the roads are very uh, long and straight, the chain is not um, necessary for play. But I found it kind of handy when you, let's say, you had something like this, where, you know, a uh, division was moving up the road, and it suddenly wanted to make a right-hand turn here at the peach orchard. With the chain, it's quite easy to show how it could move. So I might use the chain for um, in my game here when I do a playthrough. But uh, it's my understanding that the chain does not come with the game now. I'm not sure. Now the leaders, um, the rules are a little unclear. and uh, There's a lot left to the imagination in the rules, I think. I think the other reviewers have um, pointed this out also. I think uh, the fellow that does the reviews uh, bonding with war games, he did a good review of the Little Bighorn title. And uh, there was another reviewer by two fellows too that talked about this system. They liked it, but I think we all agree the, um, the rules are a little... Um, I, hate to, I don't know what, how, to, how to describe them. I don't want to say incomplete. The information is there, you can play the game. But a lot of it is left to your imagination to work out 
how that things actually work. Now, any veteran player can pick up this game. These ones are copyright 2020. But uh, I think that's one of the weak spots is the rules. Uh, especially when you open the book, for example, you've got the general rules here. And it says overview, how the game works. And the first sentence of the first paragraph is totally not applicable to Gettysburg. Uh, you secretly build your armies with points. <clears throat> well, you don't, actually, not in Gettysburg. So, uh, but any veteran gamer can figure this thing out. Now, I don't think it would be too productive for me to just state all the same things that the other reviewers are saying. Uh, I recommend you do take a look at those videos. Um, they're on the Board Game Geek and on their own websites uh, through YouTube if you want to find out more about the game in general. I thought it would be more fun to... Um, I'll just do a playthrough of the July 1st scenario. Each turn represents one hour. And I have checked the order of appearance and it looks pretty good. So what I'll do is uh, I'll play the July 1st scenario, solitaire of course, so I'll have to kind of play honest if I can. And so we have a frame of reference. What I'm going to do is more or less play the way the Confederates and the Union really fought the battle. So of course we're going to have the classic Heath coming down the Chambersburg Pike and we'll have Buford's uh, division uh, opposing him. Now in the game, by the way, one thing I do like, there isn't any points for geographical objectives. So you're not you know, trying to capture t Cemetery Hill and get 10 points and Culp's Hill get 5 points and Little Round Top 5, let's say, and the Peach Orchard 2. None of that matters. The train is good for defense, you get an advantage, but you decide where you're going to fight the battle. And if you want to have Buford fall back on the main army back here or something, it's totally open. Okay, So I can't predict where this game would go if we played it that way. So, like I said, so we have a frame of reference. I'm going to play it kind of like the way they played it. Buford will try to oppose Heath and fall back slowly. I might point out that the game, the board, very nice too. It's an old, old map. Reproduction of an old one adapted. And uh, the game goes east enough, far enough, that it includes the Rummel farm. So, you can have... The cavalry battle that occurred out here. So that's one nice thing about the map. It's wide enough to show that. And as you can see, the map also goes south of Round Top. So I won't explain all the rules as I play. Um, I will talk about the baggage train when it comes on. I will not be using all the optional rules. There are tons of optional rules which make this game, uh, I'm sure, come alive. I would love to play this uh, with a two-player two player game. And I won't be using these uh, reserve cards because, you know, I'm playing solitaire, so I can't, I'm not really fooling anybody by using them. So let me set up the game for the July 1st scenario, and we'll take it from there. Okay, I should point out uh, one other thing before I uh, commence the game. This uh, field of fire diagram, which is in the rules. Uh, that's the field of fire for a unit. So it's supposed to be 45 degrees out the front and out to one-third of the uh, foot movement range, which is, there's our foot movement range there, the black. Um, 45 degrees, well, what's 45 degrees? Uh, most people can eye it, but what I'll do uh, for now is I'll use, uh, just get a, a protractor if you, you know, have to work out 45 degrees. Um, that's one way. Uh, what I'm going to do, though, I think is I'm going to make my own little cardboard field of fire diagram. That's so you at least know how the uh, combat works. So let's uh, take a look at the setup. Okay, there's the setup for the game, something we've all seen before. So we've got uh, Heath's division coming in here on the Chambersburg Pike with the baggage train, Hill himself, uh, Buford's division just outside the town, and down here, we've got the first corps under Reynolds coming on, Wadsworth and Robinson's division. And over on the right, we've got three chits, the third corps Confederate, the cavalry for Union, and the first corps. And we put these in an opaque container, shuffle them up, 
and we draw a chip to see who's going to move first. And the winner is, we've got the first core. So the first core to Reynolds will be moving. I'll show you how that works. Okay, here's where I found the rules a little sketchy. They talk about major roads and minor roads, and I can't find anywhere in the train effects chart or anywhere what they mean by that. But from my knowledge of Gettysburg, I'm pretty sure that the major roads are these ones with the double-lined kind of trees on it. In other words, the Emmitsburg Road, the Baltimore Pike, not the Tawny Town Road. Hanover Road is major, Hagerstown, Chambersburg Pike. So anyway, um, Reynolds' first core will come on here on the Emmitsburg Road. So what we're going to do is take our movement stick here, and when you're moving on a major road, you're allowed to move twice the distance. So we've got our first mark there, and the second mark there. So, we'll have Wadsworth in the lead, put him up here. And what you do is you, of course, face the unit so that the Confederate player does not see what you have. Now, for the purpose of the video, and kind of common sense, I'm going to have Wadsworth in the lead, Robinson, and then this uh, baggage train. Now, there are rules for these blank units the trail behind, but that is not the case on major roads, so you don't have to use those. So that's the... Uh, end of the move of the first core. Now one little convention, they talk about uh, the leader unit being spent, but there's no uh, rules on how that's supposed to work. So what I did was, when you're moving the man, it's face up, showing you the general, and after you've moved him, as a reminder, just tilt him sideways, and you can see the little US flag. It's probably what the designer meant, but uh, he did not show it in the rules. So that's the movement of the first core. I'll put a number marker down there just to remind us that it's turn one. So we're going to shuffle the chits in there. Of course, there's only two left. And we draw one. And it happens to be the third core, which is the Confederates. Heath up there. Now, I've got some decisions here. Because Heath, in theory, could come up that road in column. But he'd be very vulnerable. Now, he's big, but he's carrying that baggage train there, too. So... I might want to have them come on in line instead of column. Now you can't go within column within, uh, I think it's a third of a, of a foot movement. So you can't come right up to the guy in column. I don't think we'd want to anyway. So I'm going to move uh, Heath and the baggage train up there in line. Now the union player wouldn't necessarily know this, of course, but I've got the two uh, units of Heath's division in the advance and of course the baggage train at the back. It would be senseless to have that uh, in the forward line. And uh, you can see Hill there, and since I've moved him, I'll flip him to show that he's moved. Well, there's only one shit left, that of course is um, Buford. So now Buford has some decisions. Like most Gettysburg games, I mean, Buford could just gallop away from there no problem. But then that would give Heath full movement depending on what the chits are. That's another nice thing about this game system. You don't know who's going to move first. So I think I'm going to try to buy some time for the Union by moving uh, Buford up. Let's move, move him up in front of Heath. Okay, this is Buford after he's moved. And you can see I've arranged him on purpose on top of this little ridge here because you do get advantage for being on a ridge. And of course this is what the Union player would see in the game. He'd just know that there's three blocks there. Of course, uh, we've memorized the order of appearance by now, so he knows that that would be uh, uh, Heath's division and the baggage train. So that would be the end of turn one. I should point out that they just give a number of turns here. There's no hour. Now, from experience, this would be around 7 a.m. in the morning. So that's the end of turn one. We check the reinforcement chart, which is very colorful. It's on a, on a page in the rules. Put the new man on the side. Uh, it's not mentioned in the rules, or rather it's very vague. But of course you put the new chits in for any new units coming on the board, and they will go in the, uh, your opaque uh, container. 
Okay, I've checked the order of appearance. For turn two, there's no new units coming on the board. And I've got a little marker here to remind us that it is turn two. Now, this is critical because, yes, we know that there's only chit, uh, three chits in there. Uh, Heath, the Cavalry, and the First Corps. But depending on who moves first, that's going to make one hell of a difference. Example, if the First Corps moves first, it could be right up here, perhaps up in Seminary Ridge. If the Confederates move first, they could smash into Devon if they, uh, they want, or rather um, Buford, although there is retreat before combat. So the chit pull is rather important. And as a reminder, again, it's not on the rules, you might want to take your leaders and flip them back up to the gold side there, just as a reminder you haven't moved them yet. So let's shuffle up those chits and see who's going to move first, because that's going to make a difference. And we pull the first core. Well, that's going to be very handy. Now, I've got to check the um, road column rules again, because I, I know you can't go uh, within a certain distance of the enemy when you're using road column. Plus, you have to be careful. If I have the first core come up, they're very vulnerable in road column. So, um, depends what I want to do with Buford. But I think I'll have the first core come up as far as I can, and... Uh, We'll catch the video after I've moved the first core. Okay, that's the first core move. What I did was come up in column up to about here and then convert to line. Cost you one third of your movement. And they cut across the fields. Uh, historically, that's what they actually did. They got up to about the Kodori farm here and cut across the fields. They did not enter the town of Gettysburg. Uh, Leaders, by the way, move whenever the core moves. So I've got Reynolds here close by these guys. And the baggage train, it has no use right now, so I try to get it uh, out of the way. So I just moved it down the Baltimore Pike. And uh, let's pick the next chit. See who moves next. And we've picked the cavalry. That's Buford. So what's Buford going to do? Well, I think Buford's going to stay put. I don't think he wants to get much closer. Well, maybe a fraction he could, but he's on that hill so I think he'll stay there. His main objective here is to just block by some time for the First Corps to deploy because that's not a great deployment for the First Corps. So that leaves the last chit to be pulled which of course is Heath. I'll look at the Confederate moves and decide what they're going to do, but I'm pretty darn sure that Hill is going to go in there and attack. Let's see how that's done. Okay, when you move, you face your front, and you're allowed to move anywhere within that 45 degree uh, angle that I was talking about before. So when you attack somebody, and the first part of Heath will do so, uh, he will advance right to there. And when you're attacking somebody, you go right adjacent to them. Now you are allowed to have a supporting unit, which Heath will use. And we know that that's the baggage train. The Union is not supposed to know that, but we know it is. So uh, we'll just keep it back there protected and we'll move Hill up a little bit too. So now we have our first attack and uh, the combat system is simple, but I've got to admit it's, it's rather elegant uh, in its simplicity. I'll get the dice out and we'll have our first attack. Heath versus Buford. Okay, there can be combat rounds. And in the first round, the units that must engage are the lead units. So the first unit of Heath here will be attacking the only unit of Buford. The Confederates will be rolling three dice, and the Union will be rolling two. Why two? Well, because Buford's cavalry is considered to be a Dragoon unit in this series. So he'll roll two dice against the Confederate three. And what you're looking for is a 4, 5, or 6. 50-50 chance of getting a hit. However, Buford is on high ground. He's considered to be in cover, which means each of the pips on the Confederate rolls will be reduced by one. So, yes, the battle is luck-oriented. All simple games uh, have that. But uh, it's rather elegant, as you'll see. Let's find out what happens. Roll the dice. 
Okay, the Confederates get a six and a five, but remember that it, technically that's reduced to a, a five, which is still a hit, and the five is reduced to a four, which is still a hit. That's because of the hill. They inflict two hits on Buford, and unfortunately Buford inflicts nothing. Now note, I could have done retreat before combat with uh, Buford, but I wanted to fight, felt lucky, did work out that way. So when you take a hit, you take your man here and you turn him 90 degrees so that he's facing up. That means he's kind of damaged. And because the Confederates got a second hit, unlike a lot of games, you don't destroy the unit. He now must retreat. Had the Confederates got three hits, Buford would have been destroyed. But Buford must retreat. And we'll do that and catch up on the video. Now the rules are a little vague here, because it says literally from the rules, the piece must turn about and make a one-third move, ignoring uh, ignoring terrain costs, back away from the enemy uh, positions. Okay, no, not a problem. Um, I'm supposing because that's cavalry, he can do a one-third cavalry move, but it doesn't say that. But I'll assume that, and then I put it here. But it says turn around. Well, what does that mean? I would think, well, I guess it's facing the rear. Not sure what that's going to do. Anyway, and uh, you're allowed to move Pleasanton, the leader, any, at any time whenever the unit moves. So that's the result of that combat. Now there's various effects for being spent, and most of them are not good. So um, more or less, Buford, if he's spent, will not be able to retreat before combat. So now he's become very fragile. But fortunately for his side, the um, first corps is in the immediate vicinity, and we'll see what happens. So we're going to be going to turn three. I'll put the new chits in, and we'll check to see if any new fellows arrive on the board. Okay, we've got some new units coming on the board. Pender's division up there. Rowley's division coming in here on the uh, Hanover Hagerstown Road, and uh, we've got parts of the 11th Corps coming on there. Now, of course, we've put the 11th Corps chit into the pool, too. That you must remember to do. And uh, we'll be pulling a chit, and we'll see who moves first. It's going to get quite interesting now. Okay, this is definitely not going to be too good for the Union, because the first chit pulled was the Confederate 3rd Corps which means Heath and these new fellows are going to be able to come on. Now, Pender is too far to really affect the combat, but Heath could attack again, and uh, the first core isn't in the best position. And uh, Buford has, remember, already been spent. So let me look at the Confederate options, and we'll see what we can do. Now, I'll take the stance that, um, you know, you're going to try to damage as many units as possible. So we may have a couple of attacks in here. should point out, too, that in order to attack, you must be within one-third of a move of your leader. So that's why you keep your leaders close by your infantry units. Which means things like uh, Rowley's uh, division coming on are out of command from Rowley. He can move full, but he cannot enter combat. Uh, good rule. Simple, but very effective. Let's see what Heath can do. Okay, this is after uh, Heath's division has moved. Heath, Heath. I've heard it said both ways. Uh, Pender's division decided to stay in column coming up the Chambersburg Pike. Half of Heth's division slammed into the rear here of Buford, because Buford is reduced, and uh, the other half slammed into uh, the first core unit here. Now, um, the rules say, uh, well, Buford normally could retreat before combat, but because he's spent or demoralized, he will not be able to. So um, he's going to fight at a disadvantage now because if he gets a couple of hits, he'll be dead. So we've got two battles going on here, and we'll do the Heath versus Buford battle first. Okay, checking the modifiers for the Confederates. Heath in the Devon attack is going to be rolling three dice, but he's going to be able to add one to each dice roll because he's flanking or hitting Buford from the rear. Buford will still get his traditional two dice. Let's see what the combat is. Okay, well, it's not too good 
poor Devin. Although I think it goes down swinging. The way I see it, um, Heth inflicts three hits on Buford, which destroys the unit. But before he goes down, uh, Buford inflicts two hits on Heth. Now I'll leave Pleasanton there for a moment. So our first destroyed unit is Buford. Now Heth has to take a hit, as we saw before, and the second hit means he retreats. So we'll retreat Heath's division. Headquarters units, by the way, uh, never really die, so if they, they get bumped, you just move them. There's no harm in keeping Pleasanton there. So now we have another battle here. This time, uh, remember, this unit is in a protected position, and he's slammed into, that's the good old Wadsworth, and that's an elite unit. So each of them is going to roll three dice, and nope. The Union is not quite on the hill. So each of them is going to roll three dice. And we're looking for a four, five, or six in this battle. Okay. The Confederates this time roll a six, a one, and a three. Which is only going to be... On the Union rolls a five and a four. Where'd that other die go? They rolled a four. Whoa! So the Iron Brigade inside Wadsworth is really proved to be formidable. Now, I'll have to check the rules, what happens when you get three hits on a unit. It might be destroyed. I'll just have to check. And uh, the Confederates, though, do inflict one on Wadsworth. So Wadsworth definitely goes up one, loses one. Heath certainly loses one. The second one is a retreat, so I don't know how this third one is implemented. Let me just check the rules. Nope, the rules say if you get three hits on a fresh piece, it is destroyed. So the equivalent of two brigades have been smashed up by the good old Wadsworth. So that's the end of the combats. Kind of bloody, but that's the way things go. Okay, we're drawing the next chit. So we don't know who's going to move. And it happens to be the cavalry, Union. But the cavalry's dead. So what I'll do is I'll just move Pleasanton out of here. Just move him one whole full length. Just, just get him right out of the, out of the battle for now. He can be used later when other cavalry units come in. So let's draw another chit. See who's moving. And it happens to be the first core. Okay. Well, the first core is in not a bad position. Wadsworth is wounded, but so's Heath or Heth, and he still has. Um, Another unit here, plus Rowley's coming on. So let's see what uh, the first corps can do. Is it good to attack the other half of Heath or stand pat and defend? Let's take a look. Well, I was tempted to do a counterattack there on Heath while he was uh, vulnerable, but I decided the discretion was the better part of valor. So I brought Rowley up. Wadsworth is in the middle, still wounded though, although it is an elite unit. And Robinson is partially on Seminary Ridge and partially in the plain here above Pennsylvania College. Now in the game, you don't really want to go into the town of Gettysburg. If you do, you get kind of disrupted and messed up. Uh, you can go through the town in column, but uh, you don't want to really go in the town of Gettysburg. So that's the end of the First Corps movement. Now there's only one chit left. That's the 11th Corps. So the 11th Corps will be moving, and that's the two divisions of Barlow and Schurz coming up the Emmitsburg Road. Okay, that's the situation at the end of turn three. Barlow and Schurz have moved up the Emmitsburg Road, Union First Corps baggage train, and First Corps has got a, not a bad line there along the Hagerstown Road and Pender is coming up. So turn four should be interesting. Okay, we've got some new units coming in. Steinweir's division here, Tawny Town Road. And we, up in the north, we've got Rhodes division coming in over here. So uh, let's pull the chits and see who's moving first. Okay, we've pulled the Confederate Second Corps chit. And uh, the division of Rhodes will be coming in along with the uh, Ewell's baggage train. Now, in the order of appearance, they have 
a little liberal setup, which is fine, because we know that Rhodes actually came in broken up. Some of his men came in here on this um, Newville Road, Carlisle Road, and some of them appeared on Oak Ridge. So in the game, you're allowed to come on between these three areas, which is just fine. So let me look at their options, see what's the best thing for them, probably to come in here and start outflanking the first corps. Uh, it would have been nice for the 11th Corps to move first. This way they would have been able to plug up their line. But uh, I'll do a move that would be more damaging to the Union because that's what the Confederates would have done. They would have come in on the flank, I'm sure. Okay, I think the best move for Rhodes is to do as I've depicted here. Just come in square on the flank of the Union First Corps. And, of course, that's the baggage train, which you want to leave at the back. I think that's the best move uh, for Rhodes. So we'll uh, draw some chips and let's see who moves next. Because if it's the Confederates, it's not going to be too pretty. Okay, we drew a chit. Uh-oh. Yeah, it's the Confederates. That's not going to be good. That's Hill's Third Corps. And he's got Pender's division up. Now, Pender might be just be able to get into order of battle against the First Corps. Let's look at their options and see what Hill can do. It's not as bad as I thought because Hill, as a corps commander, is technically out of uh, uh, too far from the rest of his division. Because you have to be within one third of a cavalry move to a division to be in uh, uh, attack command, which is only this division here. So these two units cannot get into battle. Now they can probably get into a nice position, but the attack is probably not as strong as I would like. So Hill might have to use this turn to just consolidate his position against the first corps. Okay, that's after uh, Pender has moved. All he did was connect his line to Heath. Hill himself moved here. And this is the third car artillery. Now, there is long range artillery in the game, but like most Gettysburg games, or good games in the Civil War, it's difficult to get your artillery to fire long range unless they have good, clear fields of fire. And I haven't been able to find one right, right now. You're not allowed to fire through your own men. So you need to be on a hill, have a clear line of sight to attack the enemy at, at the distance. So that's not always easy to do. Baggage trains are just remaining in the rear or they're ever, out of everybody's way. So we'll pick a chit again. Let's see who's moving. The chit pulled is the first core. So, first core has got some decisions. Uh, not a lot of decisions, but they've got some decisions. I don't think they want to attack. Pender's up now. They have one wounded division. They'll probably consolidate their line. Uh, let's look at their options. And we don't know who's moving next. Could be, well, it'll probably be the 11th, right? Or, well, the Confederates have moved. So the First Corps can plan their move on where the 11th will be. Let me look at the situation and move the First Corps. And remember, the town of Gettysburg is not very desirable to be in. So it might be time now to retreat the right flank. Not sure. Okay, I didn't bother to uh, film pulling the chits because the only chits left were the 11th and the cavalry. So the first corps did fall back. They had plenty of maneuver room. I pulled Rowley back here to McPherson's Ridge. Wadsworth is here on Seminary Ridge. Robinson is just south of the town. Remember, you want to be avoiding the town. Now, again, what's the town? Well, it's pretty obvious it's these hexes here or spots there. Uh, here it's a little populated. I would still consider that part of the town. That's where interpretation of the ground comes in here. And um, got Barlow here in this open plain. Schur is sitting up on Cemetery Hill and Steinwehr's division coming up. Now it might be time to consider moving this baggage train. Uh, no emergency just yet, but uh, something to think about for the future. So that's the end of turn four. And uh, we'll get a far view of this. Okay, that's the end of turn four. Union doing not too bad. Casualty wise, the Confederates have lost one unit and the Union has lost one unit. So, still a fairly equal battle. So, on to turn five. Okay, well, checking the length of the video, that's about 20 25 minutes, I think, at least. So, I'll halt the video there. And uh, I think I will play it on. I should point out that for uh, Gettysburg, uh, the battle one day takes eight turns. 
So I'll have, uh, you know, a few more turns to go, then July 1st will be over. But I don't want to make this a long, long video, so I'll halt it there, edit it, and uh, post it uh, in the next few minutes. So uh, there will be a part two, because I'm curious to see how this game uh, goes too. But um, and I'll keep my summation on the game itself, what I like about it, what I don't like. It's mainly light, though. I, I think it's a, a good, nice, light game on Gettysburg and uh, a lot of fun. So uh, thank you for watching part one and stay tuned for part two.